So when I was originally asked by Kasia to do this presentation, I was actually sitting in the Pearson office for the first time in two years. Two years I've been working from home and I was thinking of titles and one I came up with was English assessment after COVID. And then I went home, woke up the next day, wasn't feeling fantastic, took one of those little COVID tests and it turned out, of course, I had COVID. So talking about things being after COVID, I think that was a good reminder that that might be a little bit optimistic. We're still dealing with the pandemic. We're still dealing with the effects of the pandemic on learning. And some of those changes will be temporary, but some will be permanent. It has all sorts of interesting new opportunities, but also new challenges for learning. And I think hopefully quite an interesting way in which assessment can help meet some of those new challenges. And that's really what we'll be focusing on today with the question, does a new learning landscape require a new approach to English assessment? There's a principle in journalism called Betteridge's Law of Headlines, and it says any newspaper headline that you see that is framed as a question can almost always be answered with the word no. So is this the end of plastic bags? Will this be the final scandal that brings down uh, Prime Minister Johnson? The answer is almost always no. This is why you're framing it as a question. And I do think sometimes the same can be applied to presentations and conferences. Does a new learning landscape require a new approach to English assessment? Maybe, maybe not, probably no. But there are some opportunities, I think, to answer that question in a, in a slightly more interesting way. And I think we're gonna look at those today. We could just stick with that big end of year test, the way that we've been doing it for a long, long time. So learners learn at the end of the year, they're given a summative test and we find out what they can remember. So some learners will pass, some will fail, some who probably should have failed will pass, some who could have passed will fail. The world will keep turning, you know, the circle of life will continue as it has for about 1500 years. And I say 1500 years because, let me run to the next slide, not that much has really changed in assessment since the emperors in China first introduced written exams for the civil service about the year 600. So you learn at the end of that course of learning, you take a pen or whatever kind of writing implement they were using at the time, you get a piece of paper and you're asked some questions and you write down what you can remember in response to those questions. And you hand your piece of paper to an examiner. They look at it and say, that looks like a seven out of 10 answer to me. And a couple of weeks later, somebody tells you whether you've passed the test or you failed. Now, I'm not that old, um, but I, mean, I do have a little bit of gray hair, but that's, that is pretty much how, in, how assessment worked when I was at school. Um, it's how our paper-based English assessment international certificate works today. It's how Cambridge Main Street works as well. Now, of course, today the exam doesn't last three days. We don't lock you in a cell or a cave to make sure you're not cheating as the Chinese emperors would. Um, but the principle is pretty much the same because it works. It's a, it's a good system. Uh, the question is really, is it the only thing that assessment can be used for? Is it the only way in which assessment can help as part of that learning journey? And I would say it isn't. And it's that 25 years of innovation, I think is the really interesting part for me. Because what we're looking at is the use of computers in assessment, the use of digital resources to test learners. And this really stems back to some research and work that was done at the University of Stanford and the University of Colorado in the US in the early 1990s around the measurement and assessment of speech, measurement and assessment of writing. And that really became the, the versant English test, which today is part of the Pearson portfolio. But it's not just Pearson that's using this kind of technology. Uh, this is growing, this is expanding in terms of use, and it really does change the framework of what assessment can be. 
So assessment can be fast. We have tests now that can measure all four skills and give results to those learners after the test has been taken within about five minutes. So the whole marking process is by computer, takes about five minutes to get the results to come back. They can be much easier to implement. So the days of teachers having to write the exam, mark the exam, interpret the results, share the results, all those sorts of things, that can now all be automated. They're much more accurate than fast methods of measuring English have been in the past. You can have a fast way to measure somebody's English with an assessment and always can it, you know, have, have had that. But traditionally, that's really emphasized multiple choice above other things, just because it's the easiest thing to mark. You can set a multiple choice test, you get 25 out of 30, that gives you your results. What it doesn't give you is a lot of depth and information and accuracy around that measurement necessarily. Tests can be scalable. By that we mean they can be taken more or less anywhere at any time. You can very often test large numbers of people for not a lot of money. And they can also be data rich. There's a lot of information that comes back out of those tests now with computers that you wouldn't have necessarily had in the past. So you have all this fantastic technology, all these fantastic options available to us. What should we do with them? And the answer, of course, of course, is more tests. Now, there's another principle we have in English called Maslow's Law of the Instrument. And it says, if you have a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And I think that's something we need to look at when we're you know, discussing these things as English testing people. It means that if you have a bias towards something, you think that thing is the solution to all of life's problems, uh, whereas you know, perhaps it, it might not be. So if you ask me, somebody who's been working in assessment for nearly 20 years, how do we better improve that learning journey? I'm gonna say tests. Of course I am, because that's that's my that's my bias. That's what I'm. That's what I do. Um, so it's something we need to you know really interrogate and really make sure that we're recommending things that are appropriate for the for the learning journey. Things that really have a value, and we do have to accept very reluctantly that not everybody likes tests. This probably is how a dentist feels as well. You know, we think they're good for you, but we understand that not everybody not everybody likes us sometimes for good reasons. So again, we work with you, work with our partners, work with universities and schools to overcome some of those barriers, to really understand what those challenges are, what those misperceptions or what those accurate perceptions of how things have worked in the past are, to overcome the challenges together. And one of the challenges is that teachers very often don't like tests for very good reasons. If you are responsible for running the full administration of the test, as I say, everything from writing to invigilation to marking, all those sorts of things, that's time that you could be better spending doing something else. It's also not why you became a teacher. If you became an English teacher, you became an English teacher to teach English. You didn't become an English teacher to teach a test. And that line can sometimes be a little bit blurred teachers feeling like they have to teach towards a test and not, you know, not so much teaching English as a subject in itself. So one thing we need to look at there is how do we make sure that tests are what we call course agnostic? So it doesn't matter which learning pathway you've chosen for your learners, it's a fair measure of their level of ability. Parents as well, I think particularly in the current environment, are getting a little bit more demanding. There's a really big pushback against exam stress, testing stress from parents who say, this is taking away focus from education and it's making my child not want to learn. Um, so we need to make sure, firstly, that we're trying to take all the stressful elements out of that assessment process. But any assessment we suggest has to have a value and a purpose that we can clearly articulate. We can't test just for the sake of testing. There needs to be a clear value that we can explain, not just to, to teachers, but to parents as well. And of course, to students. I think, you know, in most classes, you'll find one or two learners who like to take tests, but the majority probably don't. So any tests that we're using need to be clearly motivational. They need to be a tool to spur learners on and not a thing that they're going to be scared of that will put them off learning. 
I think another challenge that we're dealing with at the moment is that we understand that school budgets are really quite tight. It could be parents dealing with the impact of inflation. It could be you know, the impact of COVID on our, you know, numbers of learners within a school environment or the ability of their parents to pay, who knows? Um, so when we say that tests are affordable, that needs to be taken into account. They might possibly, depending on the, the tests that you use, cost a fraction of a traditional assessment methodology. But if it's a new cost that you're introducing to your school, it has to be an investment and not just a burden, not just a cost. It has to have genuine value for money. And the last one is a very practical point, that new technology needs new ways of supporting learners and supporting teachers and users. There's no point in us saying, oh yeah, the, the tests save time and money if you need to have a degree in computer science to understand how they work and how to implement them. They need to be easy to use, they also need to be easy to understand and easy to support by the, the teams that we have working with teachers. So that's kind of an idea of what's going on in the background when we're looking at assessment and how assessment can potentially fit into learning frameworks. How we break it down at Pearson is into four separate categories, place, benchmark, certify and verify. And this kind of really does capture different parts of that learning journey. Place is where somebody comes to you, perhaps it's their first day of class, perhaps they haven't even signed up for a course yet, but they're interested in doing so, could even be for something like a job interview. And you need a way to check their level of English very, very quickly in a, you know, a methodology that covers the full range of ability from beginner all the way through to really highly proficient, just so you can understand what to do with them next. Benchmarking takes that idea a little bit further. What we're doing with benchmarking is measuring changes to uh, ability over time. Perhaps it's a, a test at the start of the year and at the end of the year, maybe in the middle as well, if you're getting enough learning hours. But it's understanding progress, understanding the changes in ability over time, not just so you can say, well, the number is going up as it should be, but so you can get an idea of what the strengths and weaknesses of those learners are and put some remediation in place if they've got a particular weakness that you can identify through assessment. Certification is really where you're taking that score the learner has and making it tangible to people outside of the school. It might be another school, it might be a university, it might be an employer, it might be a government agency, the civil service, whoever it might be, but they need to know that a test has been done in a certain way and certifies that that learner has the, the skills that they're claiming to have. Verify is the one that we won't focus on too much today, um, but that really is typically for things like immigration, uh, access to universities in English speaking countries, uh, which is where PT Academic and PT Home come in. And that really does focus a lot more on the security of testing for practical reasons, but for also for political reasons, it's very important that government agencies have trust that beyond any shadow of a doubt, the person who's taking that test is the person they say they are. So palm vein scanning, CCTV cameras in every, uh, in every room, all those sorts of things that come with that high, really high security testing model. That's really how we break assessment down into categories. So looking at the first one, we're talking about placement. So I've got a question for you, or two questions for you. you can answer one of them, both of them, neither of them, it's up to you. How do you place students in the right class if they're new? And how do you know the level of proficiency a new student has? So I'll give you two or three minutes to, to answer in the chat. That'd be really interesting, uh, interested in your, your placement method. How are you doing this at the moment? Okay, I'm saying placement tests are a good way to do it. Yep. Diagnostic tests. Okay, a lot of people are using placement tests. Interesting. Ah, self prepared placement tests as well. Interesting. Very interesting. Short conversation, three, yeah, okay, through speaking, learning, yeah, this is, this is, this is perfect. This is exactly what 
uh, I was expecting and what I was looking for. This is a lot of really interesting responses, different ways to place learners uh, that fall into a couple of you know, key categories, but a lot of people using placement tests at the moment. So we'll move on. How has this potentially been impacted by the pandemic? So one of the things that people were mentioning is you know, looking at their learning record. That's you know, a good way to do it in a lot of cases. If somebody, you know, I think it's a quite a common conversation for teachers to have. You know, if somebody comes in and says, well, I, I'm B1, what, what would you recommend for me? And the teacher says, well, how do you know you're B1? And they said, well, I've got B1 in my school exam. I have the Pearson English International Certificate Level 2. I have Cambridge Preliminary, so on and so forth. And that's fine. The challenge, really, over the last two years is a lot of those traditional assessments have been disrupted. So maybe you're going to take a Pearson Certificate or a Cambridge test, but your school was closed or you missed the window or that school exam that you would have taken in English didn't take place because they're assessing a different way, whatever it might have been. But it's not necessarily as easy for everybody um, who might once have taken a certificate uh, to, to estimate their own level of ability if they haven't been able to take those formal tests. Another thing that we're seeing at the moment is that learners have maybe a slightly different profile if they've been learning in a different way over the last two years. It may be learning online, it may be a greater emphasis on self-study than formal teaching. So when they come back into the classroom, their profiles might not necessarily line up in the way that we would have expected. It's something that we do need to do a lot more research into. And I think it will vary from country to country, perhaps even by age group to age group. But something we're starting to see as an emerging trend is learners who have really quite strong speaking abilities, but their listening ability isn't really matching that. Their listening ability maybe because of the way they've been learning due to the pandemic isn't quite as strong as their speaking. So what we call that is a spiky profile. Their skills are maybe a little bit different uh, in relation to each other. So if you're not testing all four skills, that can be quite a challenging thing to pick up. We also heard people saying, you know, that classic method is, well, they come in, I have a conversation with them, I get a sense of their ability, and I get a sense of which class might be best for them. Still a, a relatively you know, good way to, to do that, but quite challenging if you've got additional time pressures for teachers. Perhaps you're not meeting that person face-to-face -face and it's you know, via a computer or some other method. So perhaps not quite as easy to do that face-to-face -face interaction uh, and assessment as, as might have been the case. And then the other one, a lot of people saying placement tests and placement tests can be a fantastic way to do that. But that traditional paper-based placement test a lot of people have used might be quite tricky if that learner is not going to come into the school before they start their course. Perhaps they're not going to come into the school at all. They're learning 100% from home. So you need to have a methodology to place with placement tests that adapts to that. And that, I think, is really where the, the Pearson English level test comes in. So it's a 30 minute test with speaking included and 20 minutes with just three skills. Uh, it covers the full range of the common UK framework of reference. It's general English. It can be done whenever you need to do it, wherever you need to do it. As an online test, learners can take it from home if they want to. Uh, you get a score within a half band of the common European framework. So B1, B1+, plus, B2, B1+, plus, and so on. And you get a sense from that school report which of the learners' abilities are at that level, above that level, or below that level. As I mentioned, this is 100% scored by computer. There was a, a question in the chat, which is, I think is obviously one of the things that people always ask, uh, very, very justifiably, how can a computer measure speaking? Um, I think the, the presentation that will cover that in the most depth is the one that uh, Dr. Bill Bonk is doing a little bit later today. But ultimately, we train 
computers, we train artificial intelligence, machine learning models to look for the same traits as a human examiner. So what we're doing is not replacing human judgment, which is really impossible. Language is a human construct. Uh, we're replicating human judgment in a computer form that is standardized and perhaps more accurate than um, human assessment usually can be without a lot of complexity and different parameters in place. Now, placement testing obviously is, is important, it's good, it's, you know, it gets people off to, to the right start. Um, but to me, the most interesting thing is benchmark testing, just because it's so new and it's so innovative. And as I say, it's measuring English over time in a way that I don't think has been really done as well before. So again, questions for you. How do you know if your learners are making progress? How do you demonstrate that progress to them and their parents? So again, I'll give you a, a couple of minutes. Tests. Quiz, okay. Individual notes and observations, interesting. Feedback, a lot of people like tests, a lot of people using tests, that's what I like to hear. Progress tests, okay, interesting. So yeah, very, very interesting, good, good answers there. So again, looking at how, oh, sorry, spoilers um how has progress measurement changed or perhaps become more complicated in some ways due to the pandemic i think one of the things that we saw uh, in the responses and one of the things we hear from teachers is you know, that, that classic method of checking on people's progress is classroom observation who's putting their hand up to answer questions who's engaging in the group work, how are they doing? Maybe a little bit more challenging in an online model or using hybrid blended learning methods. And we're also looking now at different methods of learning, different methods of teaching and different methods of planning lessons. One of the really big challenges I think that teachers that I've spoken to have had is if they feel like it's a little bit harder to get a sense of how the learners are doing, that really does impact their ability to plan lessons. They don't know where to target the remediation because that initial assessment of how the class is doing, how the individual learners are doing, is perhaps a little bit more challenging. It's also been a really quite disrupted learning journey over the last two years for a lot of students, which means not just in terms of English, but their other studies and life in general has been putting a lot more pressure on them more challenges, which potentially can mean that they're learning at different rates. So I think there's a question mark as to whether linear progression through a course book has ever been a fantastic measure of somebody's gains in proficiency, but more so than ever, with that disrupted learning journey, with that additional pressure, it's not necessarily a fantastic uh, way to measure. Yes, this person has got to the end of the B2 book, doesn't mean that they've not forgotten two thirds of what they've learned along the way. It's something that essentially placement tests, sorry, uh, progression tests potentially can be a much better way of addressing. And there's also related to that potential for very negative impact on learner motivation. I think that teachers who teach at a high level would be quite familiar with learners who maybe start a course at a B2 and 18 months later, they're still at a B2. And with COVID, that could be two years, three years, we may be at the B2 level and not necessarily seeing measurable progress. And the real risk there is that they say, well, I'm not getting any better, so I might as well stop, which obviously we want to try and avoid. And the last one is quite a tricky one as well. I think particularly if you're looking at online learning and blended learning, I know from working digital assessment for a long time, that if things are online, People expect them to be cheaper 
or perhaps even free. And you see that also with some students at universities saying, well, why am I paying 10,000 pounds a year for my university course when I'm not even setting foot in the classroom? And of course, we know the answer to that is you have to pay teachers, you have to pay for resources. The classroom probably still exists and needs to you know, have the heat and the light turned on, even if you're using that remote learning methodology. But it's winning the trust of the parents, understanding on their part that the money they're paying is actually being used for something valuable, that it's an investment that I think is perhaps a little bit challenging now that different teaching methods are being used and that emphasis on online learning. We need to show it has the same value in some respects as traditional classroom-based learning has. We have the benchmark test to do this. So it, the purpose, as I say, is to measure progress over time. Take a test at the start of the year, earn at the end of the year and see the difference between those two. If you have enough guided learning hours it, with that student, potentially taking a test in the middle as well. There are four different levels, A1, A2, B1, B2, and the C1, C2 level, and different forms of each test. So again, you can take a B1 test at the start of the year, a B1 test in the middle, and you should see a change in the score because what you're getting is a granular score on the global scale of English. It's not just B1, it's a specific numerical score that can go up. Again, computer marks everything, including speaking. I will mention a little bit more about how that's done at the end. And um, it takes 45 minutes. Results usually come back within about five or 10 minutes. It can be done from home, can be done in the classroom. I think the really interesting thing is the detailed information that it gives. You get that granular score at 36. You get that CEFA level, the A2 plus, whatever it might be. You get that breakdown of scores per skill. So reading, writing, listening, speaking, you can see at an individual level, yes, this learner is doing better on speaking than they are on listening. But you can also do a group report. So what is the overall proficiency of my class? They're at 55 as an average overall, but the average for speaking is only 49. I know I can focus a little bit more next term on speaking because that's where the weakness is or that's what they're struggling the most with. Uh, and alongside that you get your, your statement of current capabilities. So that's I think quite, quite good, quite valuable. But the really interesting thing for me about benchmark is how it links in to the Pearson learning resources. So what you can do is when you're looking at a school report, whether for an individual or for a group, select the Pearson book that you're using from a drop down menu. And if you know that they need to focus a little bit more on their listening, then you, you're going to get exercise references, page references for the Pearson book that you're already using that will tell you which exercises will help them the most. So a lot of the work around lesson plan really does get done that for you, hopefully by the computer. It guides you towards the remediation materials that are going to help you the most in addressing the challenges that that individual learner or that class group has got. We also have a benchmark test for young learners. So the benchmark test is, we would say, for learners aged about 14 years and upwards. Uh, for learners between the ages of six and 13, we have benchmark young learners which is designed to give the same depth of information, that same guidance for lesson planning, uh, but in a very fun, agile, tactile way for, for younger learners. Really thinking about that idea of testing stress being a problem for, for the very youngest, very smallest kids. And it's the only time I've ever been in the classroom watching people take tests and get to the end, hands go up and say, I've finished, can I take another test now? So hopefully that gives a kind of a fairly good indication of how fun this test really is. But at the same time, it is a proper analytical tool for measuring people's English. It's just done in a different way using different technology that feels a lot more approachable and engaging for younger learners as tests really should. 
Now, you may be asking, how does this work? How do you connect the books, the learning resources, and the tests together? And the answer is the global scale of English. That is the glue that binds everything together. Now, I could talk for hours about the GSE. I won't, don't worry. Um, but really, what it does is it takes the common European framework of reference, all of those can-do statements, and adds a lot more to it. Adds many, many more can-do statements, balancing out some of the gaps for the different skills that were in the original CEFR. Really, what we've done is we've asked teachers, real teachers all around the world, what's most important to them? What are the skills that they're measuring at different levels? And built that into a much more detailed framework than the CEFR was originally designed to be. So thinking in terms of progression, if you're looking at learners who are maybe at the B1 level going into B2, it can take a slow learner about 380 hours to go from B1, sorry, a fast learner, 380 hours to go from B1 to B2. A slower learner might take 1,100 hours to make that same progress. And that's 1,100 hours potentially before a test that is aligned fully to the CFR, but only reporting the CFR, will tell them they've made any progress at all. With benchmark testing, alongside the GSE, we say that measurable progress is three points. That brings, at the B1 level, it down to 70 hours for a fast learner or 210 hours for a slower learner. And that really is what we're talking about when we're saying motivational tool. We're saying, you know, maybe you come in at B2, and you're still at B2 a year later. But if you know you started at 59 and you're ending that course at 72, and the next time you take a test in a few months' time, you're probably going to be in that C1 range, maybe you're 76, 78. That becomes a measurable way to you know, check your progress. And it becomes a real strong motivational tool for learners to press on beyond that plateau of B2 or B1, whatever it might be, wherever they're feeling stuck, it gives them a sense of progress. It also demonstrates the efficacy of your teaching to parents. They're saying, don't just take my word for it. Here's a numerical score that says, this is where the learner started. This is where they are now. That difference in score is the difference that I have made as a teacher. And the difference, you know, your tuition fees, whatever it might be, is paid for. Now, the GSC is a wonderful tool. I would say, even if you're not a Pearson customer, even if you never buy a book or a test or a learning resource or training from Pearson, it's a great thing to get to know as a teacher. It's fantastic for lesson planning. You can do anything from planning an individual lesson to, I would say, building an entire framework for learning at your school just using the free resources in the GSC teacher toolkit. So, a really useful thing to get to know. No obligation to buy anything. It's all online and accessible to you. And what could be better than a single detailed scale for learning, a structure, a framework for your courses? That's right, there's four of them. So we have one for young learners, one for academic English, one for professional English, and one for adult learners. So it doesn't matter who you're teaching, there'll be a really useful resource available to you for free that will help you plan your lessons, to you know, plan the entire curriculum if you want to. So, all those new ways of assessment I think are fantastic, but they don't necessarily mean you have to stop doing that big end of year test. Um, you know, opinions vary, you know, in the age of digital badging and certification and blockchains, whatever else it might be, but there's still something really special about that old fashioned piece of paper with a certificate you can hold in your hand, you can show to your parents, you can put in a nice little portfolio and you can show to the university, government, you know, employer, whoever else it might be. That qualification, I think, is really quite nice. So we still have that qualification element within the Pearson portfolio as well. But I'd be interested to know a little bit more from you. Has the way in which you prepare learners for formal certificated tests changed over the last couple of years? Are your learners taking the same certificate 
tests in 2022 that they were taking in 2019. So again, I'll give you a couple of minutes to, to give your thoughts on that. More digital books being used. Updated tests, interesting. Some people saying no change, some people saying, yeah, there's, there's been a bit of a change in terms of how we're doing things. Okay. Some interesting perspectives coming through. I'll give you just another minute or two to, to put your thoughts down. This is always, this is, this is the part of the job I love. I love you know, hearing from teachers. Limit tests and assess speaking more, interesting. Almost the same in changes ahead. Very, very interesting perspective. Okay. Change is important. Uh, I think that's a, it's an interesting perspective and one that I would agree with. So looking at certification. So one of the big challenges, of course, we've had is that we haven't always been able to take tests. Uh, in some situations over the last two years, it hasn't been safe. And in some countries, it hasn't even been legal to have a group of learners sitting down and taking the test at the same time in the same place in the way that they have traditionally done. And I know this very well because I work on our paper-based tests as well. Um, the number of times our partners in Greece, in, for example, have got in touch with us ahead of the exam and said, I know we had a thousand learners for the test coming up, but the government shut all the schools so nobody can take a test. And that's, that's fine. You know, safety has to come first. It has to be everybody's priority, not, not assessment, not business safety. But it's also really quite disruptive for those learners and disruptive for the, for the learning journey. Something we do need to take into account. Another really interesting thing is learners who've been studying in a digital environment might prefer to be tested that way. So these are people by and large who've grown up around technology and have spent the last couple of years using technology to learn. I remember a couple of years ago, I signed up to do some competitor research. I signed up to do a Cambridge test, uh, which I passed by the way. But my concern obviously wasn't the level of English uh, that I had in terms of taking that test. It was, could I write with a pen in a way that anybody could understand? Because that's not a skill that I've had to use since I was about 20. Could I still do it? And, you know, Obviously, I appear to have been able to do that, but I don't think that that is an uncommon fear. People like to communicate through digital methodologies because that's what they do day in and day out. Expectations around convenience and speed are also changing. So I think you still have learners who are happy enough to take a test at the end of the term and then after the summer, they come back and get their certificate. But you also have an increasing number of people, I would say, who want to have a test that is very fast. They want the results ASAP, but either because they want to use them for a specific purpose or just because they don't like waiting. And you know, young people, very demanding these days when it comes to waiting for things, people expect things to be fast if they're computer-based, if they're online. And perhaps the most interesting thing is that the growing preference for testing from home, right? If the technology is there, if the security is there, why should I leave my house to take a high stakes English test? Something that learners are increasingly asking us. Now from this, what we take away is that people like to have options. We did some research last year uh, in Poland, Argentina, Mexico, Italy, and Spain, and asked people, you know, if you had a, a choice, would you be interested in taking a test at a traditional paper-based testing center, at a digital testing center, so taking a computer-based test within a center, or a computer-based test from home with video monitoring. And quite consistently, there wasn't necessarily a huge amount in it, so I don't think anybody's throwing away the idea of uh, paper-based testing, but consistently taking a test from home was the preferred option. And that is new. That is the really interesting thing about it. Because we asked them, if we'd asked you a couple of years ago, would you have taken a test from home, like a secure certificated test? 45% of people said, no, I wouldn't have considered it. And today, 
80% of people say it's very likely or quite likely to consider taking a test from home with video monitoring. I think, again, what we're looking at here is giving people choice. So with the Pearson English International Certificate, our formally certificated English test, we're still running that paper-based test seven times a year. We want to test large numbers of people on a particular Saturday in where it might be March, May, June, October, you can do that. And that would still be the best choice for quite a few learners who are comfortable with that traditional way of testing, or perhaps you don't have the technology to, to run a test in their own home without the internet going down or whatever else it might be. It's a very valid way to do it. But we also have a computer-based test now that you can run 365 days a year whenever you need to run it. So if you're saying, oh, I'm busy on Saturdays, take the test on Thursday. Um, take the test at midnight if you want to. It's up to you. We'll make that work. So you can do a computer-based test potentially in the test centre or from home with that video security that I mentioned. And the results come back faster with the computer-based version. So it's two weeks at the moment. We'd like to get that down to something closer in the future uh, to the, the PT academic score turnaround, which is about 48 hours. So imagine in the future, a certificated formal English test that gives you your, your results within about two days. We're not quite there yet, but we're gonna get that. It's two weeks at the moment. And there's different ways to do this. You could take that paper-based test and you can just put it on a screen, uh, which is what a lot of organizations have done when they've moved to computer-based testing. Uh, or you could use different item types, different methodologies, utilizing the unique way in which learners engage with the computer to test the same skills in a different way. And that's the method that we've done with. We've done a, a genuine computer-based test, a genuine digital test, not just putting a question on the screen and asking you to type your answer to that. It's a lot more engaging, a lot more interesting, I think, for learners as well. But it ends up with the same certificate because we're you know, essentially testing the same skills. And sometimes people do ask me, well, you know, can you really take a test from home and have it be secure? And the answer is yes, ultimately you can. Um, so it's a combination of different things. It's a combination of technology, so ID verification, AI-based facial matching, digital room capture, all sorts of things. But the, the core of it is you've got somebody watching you take that test in real time. If you start to do something, pick up a book or something, they can tell you to stop. They can engage with you in real time, pause your test and say, you're doing something that I'm not clear on. Can you explain yourself? If they're not happy with the explanation, if they see something going on, another person in the room, for example, they can just say, sorry, I'm going to stop that test because you're not taking the test in the way that it was intended to be taken. So as secure, we would say, as that traditional testing centre. Before we move on to some questions and hopefully some answers from my side, some tips for some teachers uh, listening to this and thinking, wow, this is a lot of information to take in, uh, a lot of things to perhaps bear in mind. One really good suggestion is to pilot solutions in advance. So we're very, very confident that these are fantastic resources for, for teachers and for learners. But let's see how they work for your learners in your environment with your technology. You know, work with Pearson to maybe do a little bit of a pilot in advance. It can identify anything that needs you know, potentially training, needs some intervention from Pearson in advance of it becoming an issue. So piloting solutions is a good way to go about it. Test familiarization matters as well. I think this is one of the really important things. These tests, as I say, are designed to not discriminate against learners who have taken one particular learning journey versus another. As long as they're at the same level, they'll get the same score. But just because it's a slightly different way of doing things, perhaps different item types, having some level of familiarization for learners, doing a sample test, maybe working with a teacher to understand what the different item types are very, very quickly, um, can just give them maybe a little bit more confidence than they might have otherwise. It just overcomes a bit of a fear factor there. Another really key one is ask questions. These tests have been designed to be easy to use, easy to implement, but 
You need to have confidence as a teacher that they're designed in a way that makes sense. You need to have confidence that the approach the person is taking is, is a valid one. And you need to have confidence that when you come to implement them in the classroom, that you're not going to run into any unexpected issues or, or challenges. So get to know the test, yes, but also ask questions. We're very much here to help. This is what we, we love to do. I've mentioned it already, but get to know the global scale of English. It's a fantastic resource. English.com forward slash GFC, free to use, enormously powerful, and you know, something that we, we're really very passionate about at Pearson. It connects all of those learning resources and all of those assessments together. But even if you don't use those learning resources and assessments, it's so powerful for teachers and it's there for you to access online. I think the last one is the most challenging, and that's embracing change. This is scary. Anything that, it shouldn't be scary, but it is. Anything that changes the way you've been doing things uh, for a long time is going to have to overcome that, that potential barrier where people say, you know, this looks quite interesting, but maybe it's not for me. We're here to help you and support you with that. Um, so it's something that we're, we're very well aware of. Teachers need to have that degree of confidence. They need to know really this is a tool that helps them and it doesn't work against them. This is something that is not just going to save you time, because if it's just about saving time, who cares really? This is something that is going to give you an additional value that enables you to make your teaching as impactful as it can be. It shows the efficacy to the parents and whoever else it might be of the methodology that you're using and it motivates learners. So get to know that. And this is the direction of travel, I would say, for assessments. I mentioned you've probably seen more change in the last 25 years than you have in the previous 50, so 1500 or so, but I think this is something that is going to change even more in the future. And working with Pearson as an organization that delivers two and a half million digital English tests a year is hopefully putting you in safe hands. So Kasia, I think we're possibly pushing time, but do we have time for a question or two before we go, or is it better to follow up with, um, with emails? Well, um, there are actually some questions um, um, from uh, the audience. One of them was about Kahoot. Is it a good way to test? And what is your opinion? I like it. I mean, I think it's fun, um, but it, it, it's, not a, it's not a proficiency test. So it's a way to do quizzes in class very quickly. It relies on the teacher to, to put the information in. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a fun tool to use in the classroom. I wouldn't call it a great methodology for assessment as such. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there is another question about Kahoot tests. Are they similar to benchmark? No, I mean, what we're talking about with benchmark is a properly designed, standardized English proficiency test that is extremely sophisticated. Uh, measures all four skills. I th I'd say Kahoot is more a platform for, for fun quizzes uh, than a, an assessment methodology in itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm looking through the comments now, but I guess these were the questions that I well remembered. Maybe there are some more. There was one I saw, you know, a little bit of skepticism as to whether a computer can measure speech. What I would say is, you know, firstly, we can help you try it for yourself, um, but we deliver, as I say, over 2 million tests a year, about two and a half million that assess speech. And that can be for classrooms, it can be for universities, it can be the majority of them, I would say, are for businesses as well. So organizations like Amazon, um, who need to know if somebody's coming in and is going to be working in a job in which they're communicating in English, do they have the level of English required to do that? And Amazon doesn't sit down with an interviewer and have a conversation in English. They use one of our English tests because they know that speech is measured accurately and it's an accurate reflection of that person's ability. So understandable skepticism on something that is new but hopefully we can convince you 
both through trying it out and understanding a little bit more about how it works, talking about the future, uh, talking about digital assessment, the session coming up with Dr. Bill Bonk, who is our um, the master uh, of digital assessment, and particularly digital assessment of speech, will I think be a really interesting one for you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, there is one um, interesting comment that you need to have to, uh, to have plan B in case there is no internet connection. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. And I think the key thing is, firstly, knowing the technology you have in place. If you know the internet's going to go down a lot, well, we have some tests that can be done offline, yes, but it's the flexibility. So, okay, I was planning to test at 1.30. The internet's not working so well. Let me test at two o'clock instead. And it's the flexibility that comes with digital assessment that means you can work around any potential challenges like that. Um, yeah. How does this artificial intelligence computer speaking assessment work in practice? It's interesting. Essentially, as I mentioned, what we're doing is we're training computers to look for the same traits as human examiners do. So we have really highly trained human examiners who mark thousands, tens of thousands of spoken responses, and they give those responses a score. What the artificial intelligence machine learning system does is understand to which elements of speech those scores have been given and really enable it to replicate the scoring. So it knows which answer is appropriate for a score of 56 because You've had tens of thousands of examples scored by humans where the uh, analysis comes out as 56 for that scoring example. So it looks for similarities, it looks for the differences. And there's a lot of really good information in our validation reports. But as I say, uh, the person that can probably give you the most in-depth look is Bill Bonk uh, in the presentation that's coming up a little bit later. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is one more question uh, from Janelin, if I pronounce it in the right way. Do you agree um, of assessing students through paperwork? Do you agree with assessing students through paperwork? Honestly, yes, it can be a good way of doing it. I think coursework can be a valid way to measure somebody's proficiency. Now, it depends on what you want to measure. Um, so I would say coursework probably fits best in terms of qualifications for subjects like history, geography, whatever else it might be, where you're putting a different range of that person's ability through essays and other things. You can still, I would say, measure somebody's level of English proficiency uh, through coursework, through paperwork, but it's perhaps more challenging for the teacher to do that and you're perhaps only measuring certain things. So through coursework, through paperwork, tougher to get a sense of their listening skills, perhaps tougher to get a sense of their reading skills, uh, certainly tougher to get a sense of their speaking skills. So I would say it's not one or the other. Um, if you're using a, a paper-based assessment, of course, that will take that into account. If you're just looking at essays and classwork and you know, paper-based quizzes that you might do, it's a little bit harder to get a full sense of their level of proficiency. And of course, it's not necessarily standardized. So what we're talking about with these tests is a global standard applied to all learners everywhere. It's less about one individual teacher's subjective opinion, which may very well, of course, be correct. It's about standardizing that, demonstrating that to learners and to their parents as well. Yeah. Sure. And well, for me, from the perspective of a former teacher, computer-based testing is so um, convenient because it helps me save time and uh, I get, well, proficiency tests and tests that are created by experts and I don't have to worry about uh, if the test is created in the right way, because it's quite challenging for teachers to create tests that will be um, done in the right way. Absolutely. Prepared. So thank you uh, for today's session. Uh, there were a lot of uh, questions and comments. Uh, there is one more about this uh, <laughs> assess assessing speaking part. Uh, 
Okay. Um, are you saying artificial intelligence is able to do the speaking part of the PAIC test, for example, the role play task or discussion pros and cons? That is a great, great question. And it really does come down to test design. So at the moment, the, the computer-based version of PAIC is going to be uh, human schooled. But the intention over the next couple of months is to make sure that it's a fully computer schooled test. Now we do that by having different item types in the computer version and the paper version. So the, the role play, for example, won't be in the, the computer-based version of the test, but you'll have other methodologies for assessing speech. Computer-based scoring can't measure everything in the way that uh, a human examiner can, but it can measure proficiency just in a slightly different way, slightly different parameters for the item designs and the test design. So what we're doing ultimately is getting the same confidence in that person's ability, but just by using a slightly different methodology when it comes to designing the tests themselves. Yeah, and one, probably the last one, um, quite challenging question. Do we need formal tests at all? I don't care, it's up to you. I mean, that's a decision that you need to make as, as a teacher. I mean, if you don't feel like placement testing, progression testing and certification has a value and nobody else minds, you know, these learners are not gonna go on to uh, a situation in which they have to show their level of proficiency to somebody outside of their school. You know, if you're, you've got parents that are very confident that, you know, the, the learners are learning the way that they're supposed to, if you can motivate the learners without assessment, showing their level of progression, then, you know, we don't want to say that testing, have much I would want to, testing is not necessarily the answer to everyone's problems. But I would say I've never been to a school where assessment hasn't been useful in some kind of capacity. Maybe, maybe your school is different. And if it is, then I'm, I'm very glad to hear it. But in general, I would say that there's an assessment that helps everybody. Uh, and you just need to kind of work with person a little bit to understand which it is. It doesn't mean you have to take all the tests. It doesn't mean you have to take one particular one, but there's usually something within that school that assessment can help bring out. But yeah, I would say it very much depends on your learners, depends on your situation. And you know, I think that everybody would like to have no dentists. Everybody would like to have no exams, but you know, they have a purpose, they have a use. Yeah, thank you for answering this question. I think that it comes down to the, well, the way we want the test to work, because if we create tests to show students how much they do, don't know, it's not motivating. And in that way, probably it's not something that they will enjoy and they will understand. Yeah. But if the tests are created in such a way to show them and to show parents and to, well, to show the teacher as well, that we are making progress yeah. and we are getting there where we want to get, I think then they somehow help us motivate ourselves so. and our students. I think so. And just very, very quickly, there's a very interesting point there. What about informal tests? I would say that having tests at various different points throughout your, your class, in-class assessment, in-book assessment, so end of chapter assessment, that's a fantastic way to get a sense of whether somebody is, has understood what you've just told them. That is different from understanding their level of English proficiency because they might understand what you've just told them, but they may have forgotten what they learned three months ago. So their overall level of proficiency might change, but something that's fresh in their mind might be something that they can be assessed on. And both of those things are useful. You need to know how they understood it, but you also need to know what is their level of proficiency after a certain period of learning. Yeah. Um, yes, there are some comments about informal testing as well. Uh, in Sweden, there are no tests and they are well educated anyway, so I would disagree. Again, I think it's the perspective that we take. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you also have to look at the Swedish model where learners learn English very, very early, and very, very well in a very standardized way. And um, yeah, maybe assessment doesn't form as big a part um, because this is an assumption when you get to the end of it, everybody speaks English, which isn't necessarily the case in, in every situation in every country. Very often you are still going to need to demonstrate to, to an employer, to a university, wherever else it might be, that your English is at a suitable level. The assumption isn't necessarily there, it isn't necessarily taken on trust. True. Um, 
So we have come to the break time. Thank you very much for your session, uh, Andrea. Thank you. It was very interesting. And um, well, I guess that people enjoyed it very much because there were many comments during and many questions during the session. Um, I hope we'll come back to the um, subject of assessment and well, um, certification again in our conferences. Thank you very much for today. I hope Thank you, you so much. as well. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Thank you so much for your comments, your engagement. I think it's always really interesting. And if I can give you one recommendation, it's stay tuned for Bill Bonk's presentation a little bit later on today. I think it should be starting, is it 10 minutes it's starting? Uh, yes, or, in, in 12 minutes. 12 minutes. He is a wonderful presenter and a wonderful mine of information on digital assessment. So if you want to get a sense of what the future looks like, Bill is the person to speak to. Thank you. And have Thank a long weekend. You too, everybody.